are going to be uh, finishing up our four-week series called Our House, and I uh, decided that it needed a uh, subtitle, and uh, so I decided it should be, all right, stop, collaborate, and listen, and if you know, you know. But uh, we're going to be talking about uh, our last uh, C in the four C's, which is collaborate. And so I thought it was only appropriate to fit vanilla ice in there somewhere. And uh, so as, as a review, as a recap, to catch us all up, get us all on the same page, the big idea of this series has been, or, or the, the main point that we've been trying to get across, is that everyone uh, has an opinion uh, of church. And some, uh, some of them are not great. <laughs> um, some people, uh, when they hear about church or they hear about Christians, they have feelings of anger or sadness or joy or hope. And it just all depends on their experience with church, with believers, with us, because we are the church. Now, unfortunately, some of these negative feelings that people have are 100% justified. Uh, sometimes they are misdirected, and sometimes that person is just a mean, hateful troll. But <laughs> there's plenty of times where their feelings are legitimate because they experienced what they experienced. And those feelings are a result of whatever happened to them or near them or, or whatever. And so in hopes of clearing up that situation just a little bit, or at least doing our part to straighten things out... Uh, we've spent the last three weeks, this is the fourth week, uh, looking at things that congregations or churches or, or church communities, different values that we should have to define our relationships inside the church and outside the church. Because how many of you know that a lot of those people that are mad or mean about the church outside were once inside? And it's what happened inside that made them go outside. And so we are specifically looking at uh, a couple of uh, biblical calls. And uh, to make it fancy, they all start with the letter C. And uh, the first one we looked at was commission. And then we looked at community. And then we looked at commandment. And today, like I said, we're going to look at collaboration. And uh, when we can uh, look at these things, understand these things, and get these ingrained in us and live them out, we can be the church that glorifies and uh, glorifies the Lord and is able to change people's hearts and their attitudes and their feelings towards church. So as, as a recap, on week number one, we looked at Matthew 9, 35 through 38, and since God's word is so awesome and much better than anything I have to say, we're going to go ahead and read all of these scriptures. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. When he, uh, then he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And we read that scripture on week number one. And the main point that we tried to get across, the, the, the big idea of that week, was that Jesus stirs in his followers, which is us, a compassionate love for others and calls them to share his truth with the world, also known as evangelism, right? We talked about how evangelism gets a bad rap, um, but evangelism is simply sharing the good news, and that's what we're called to do. And so we're supposed to share the good news of the gospel, and that is known as the Great Commission. And so as we are working towards uh, uh, bettering what is going on in the here and now, we also have to make sure that we are sharing the hope of Jesus, uh, his forever gospel that is eternal. And so on week number two, we read Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. And, and again, I want to read that. It says, as a prisoner of, uh, for the Lord, then I urge you, and this is the Apostle Paul writing, he said, I, wanna, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. 
be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Do you see the theme of being unified and loving and being one? And this is the, the, the big idea for week two was that because of what Christ has done, believers walk faithfully in their calling to live in obedience and pursue unity with one another. Now, how many of you guys know that right now the world is not very unified? Our country is not very unified. But inside the church, we need to be unified, especially now because things are so disunified because we are supposed to be what is the best option, <laughs> right? We believe that we are teaching and preaching and believing the truth. And we believe that God has the answers. And in the Bible, he wants us to be in unity. He wants us to love one another, to bear one another's burdens, and to be humble and to be patient and to be gentle with one another. We are supposed to be the model of how things are supposed to work. If the world is going to learn, they're supposed to learn from us. And so the challenge that we had in week two was that by pursuing that unity and a spirit of humility, we can unleash the undispensable power of the local church to grow and change us into more Christ-like people through our godly community. And notice, it's community. If you don't have the unity, you're not a community. And so... Uh, we need to remember also that we must pursue this unity. We must pursue a spirit of humility. This isn't something that's just going to happen, right? There's lots of people that wake up every day and just let it, let it happen, and they go with the flow, right? Those are the people that aren't unified. Those are the people that are, are not living up to this, this standard that Christ has laid out for us. But it's because of what Christ has done, and we have to acknowledge what he has done, that we're able to do this. So then last week, Pastor Burton shared about uh, Matthew 22, 37 through 40, which is one of our favorite uh, passages of scripture here at Life Christian Church. And it says this, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. And after we read that and after uh, Pastor Burton explained it to us a little bit, the big idea that we wanted to get across was that Jesus cuts through all of this confusion and complexity to focus our lives on two, just two, so that we can handle it, right? Two all-encompassing truths that are meant to work together. And what are they? Love God and love others. Let's say it together. Love God and love others. The scripture tells us, that that's what it all boils down to. You know, people are, are intimidated by the Bible and they're intimidated by all the do's and don'ts that they think revolve around uh, the law and the prophets. But right here it says, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Two, love God and love others. Let's say it one more time. Love God and love others. That's what it boils down to. If we can focus on that, if we can master that, we will have not much else to worry about. <laughs> and so uh, Pastor Burton's challenge for us was the greatest commandment, which was our C word for the day. Uh, the greatest commandment means that the believer's love of God ought to overflow to loving others in a genuine way. If we truly love God, that's going to spill out on the people around us. And also our theology or our beliefs and our service uh, do not stand alone but work together. 
And uh, good theology leads to loving action, and loving action is rooted in good theology. If you believe the right stuff, you should do the right stuff. And if you do the right stuff, it's because you believe the right stuff. It's like, right? It all works together. There's some people that say they believe all the right stuff, but if it doesn't change how they live, what good is it? It's no good at all, right? What we believe must affect what we do, or it's of no use. Okay, so that's the introduction. That's the recap. That's the review. We're all caught up. We're all on the same page. So now we're going to look at the fourth week and the fourth C, which is collaboration. And I want to read Acts 6, 1 through 7, and uh, it'll be up on the screen so you can follow along. It says, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews uh, among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, uh, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Per, Parmenas. Um, I even wrote it out phonetically up here. And uh, Nicholas of, uh, from Antioch, a convert uh, to Ju- uh, Judaism, they, um, <laughs> they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now, I have an asterisk, and it says, I stumbled through this list of names for a reason. Keep that in mind. (laughs) So the big idea of today's message and the reason that we're uh, looking at this particular scripture is because I want to get across the point that no one can do it all. Not one person can do everything. Everyone can do something, but no one can do everything. This is why collaboration is an important part of living in community and contributing to society as a whole. And so our application for today, our call to action, our challenge is this. If you're taking notes, this is the part you want to write down. Collaboration allows us to work together to seek the good of our community and expand the reach of the gospel message as we live and serve in the here and now. No matter how hard we try, we can't do it all on our own. Now, there's a statistic that you've probably heard where in most churches and in in reality, most organizations, any group of people trying to accomplish anything, um, 80% of what they accomplish is accomplished by 20% of the people. And that's just a a fact of of human nature. But uh, there is something that mothers have been aware of for many years, but it was amplified during the COVID Um, 19 pandemic that I want to use as an example here. It says uh, almost everyone that was affected by this pandemic was was forced into at-home teaching, at-home schooling. Um, The kids had to stay home, right? Well, this changed life (laughs) for most people. I know at my house, I have all adult children, but they used to be gone. (laughs) <laughs> and then all of a sudden they were around all the time. And uh, it was a big change. And that's how it is for, for parents of school age children. You know, most mothers, if you sat down and talked to them about what they have to do all day, every day, you'd be like, wow, that's a lot. And then they're like, yeah. And then all my kids were here. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the very uh, theological uh, comedian Jim Gaffigan He's talking about having a, a lot of kids because he, he jokes about being Catholic and how, how many kids he has. But uh, he has a, a thing where he says, you know, when he was younger and he's just started having kids, 
Um, it's like when you're drowning and then someone hands you a baby. <laughs> And uh, I'm sure that a lot of the mothers during the pandemic, that's how they felt. They, f they felt like, man, I was barely keeping my head above water before, and now I have a bunch of kids running around the house driving me nuts. And so regular normal life is busy. And uh, then there was like so much more to manage. And uh, there was an article written called uh, The pa uh, Parental Burnout Crisis uh, reached a tipping point, and one mother, this was her quote, she said, you kind of decide what's important in the moment, and you can focus on that and do a good job with that, but something else has got to give. Something else is not going to get done. And uh, there, there's an adage that I kind of paraphrased earlier, you, you, can, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. And this, this is true in life, but especially during uh, pandemic life. But as we read Acts chapter 6, this is what they're talking about. This reality it was met face to face, and, 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 and they had to, to figure this out because there was a certain set of Christians, um, they were uh, Hellenistic, which means that they were Greek-speaking uh, Jewish converts. They were having an issue with the other people in this community because their widows weren't being taken care of. They weren't being, uh, they, the food wasn't being distributed to them. This was a real problem in this day and age because uh, back in the first century Roman world, women had a second-class citizen situation where they were very dependent on being associated with a man. And so women at a very young age would get married to a man because that's how she survived. And it was such an important transaction that they had dowries. You know, the father would pay a man to take care of his daughter. Basically, he was like, I'll give you what it takes to know that my daughter is going to be taken care of, that she's going to be in your household and that her needs will be met. And so when a woman's husband died, it was a big deal because her support system was gone. And so these widows, uh, if you look, uh, f the Jewish people specifically, which most of these Christians were, were Jewish converts, um, they knew that all throughout the, the Torah, all throughout the Mosaic law, over and over and over, God commands, take care of the widows take care of the orphans because they knew that when the man of the house was gone, these people were at the mercy of charity. They were at the mercy of those around them in their extended community. And uh, in, in the early church, they had a reputation of they had no needy persons among them. They would sell their land and they would trade so that everyone in the church was being taken care of. And that meant taking in orphans. That meant uh, finding infants that had been abandoned by Romans and taking care of them. Well, that's an added expense. That's an added trouble. That's an added uh, thing. And one specific thing that we read about was that these widows were not receiving their food. And so the 12 disciples, they, they were empowered to preach the word. And they were going around and planting churches and getting uh, uh, converts. And so it would be foolish for them to suspend that work and instead focus on trying to make sure that these widows were being fed because there were a lot of other Christians that were very capable of taking care of this need. And so they decided that they would find these seven men that would be chosen to oversee this very important work. So it wasn't as if they were saying, hey, we're super important, and we're doing this super important thing, so we need seven goobers to take care of this unimportant thing. It was made a priority, and they took care of it because it was so important. It was important to take care of those widows. It was important to make sure that they were being taken care of. So this collaboration between the 12 disciples and this larger group of Jesus followers allowed the gospel message to continue to be preached while the widows were being taken care of. And because of that, the gospel was able to expand much further than it was currently. All right, so the fact that these seven men were to serve tables did not diminish 
who they were or what they were about. As a matter of fact, not too terribly long after this, we see both Stephen's in, in Acts 7 and Philip's in Acts 8, their stories actually uh, further chronicle that they proclaimed the gospel with boldness um, and uh, they, were, they, they led great ministries of preaching the word. And it's like, oh, well, these were the guys who were picked to serve tables. But if we go back to the scripture that we read, when they were looking for these seven guys, it says they were looking for, for guys that weren't just available. They weren't just warm bodies, but they wanted guys that were full of the spirit and wisdom. And they wanted to turn over this important responsibility to them because they knew it would be done well. It says that they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And it goes on to list all these guys. So we're assuming these weren't just guys that were on the sidelines. These were vital parts of this Christian community, and they were chosen specifically to take care of this very important work. And it wasn't because this other thing was more important. It was because they were both important. And so... If we, uh, if we continue to look at collaboration, it says uh, we, we are all given a unique set of gifts. I've mentioned this many times from this very place. <laughs> we are all different. And you're looking at me thinking, thank goodness. Um, but it's true. We are all very different. We all have different personalities, and we all have a different set of gifts and talents. Some are God-given. Some are things that we've acquired. But God does not intend for us to keep those all to ourselves, And he certainly doesn't intend for us to only use those when we're out in the world getting paid, <laughs> you know? We're supposed to be using our gifts and our talents, our, our unique situation, to minister to the needs of those around us. Those first in our own family, and then those in our church family, and then our community, and so on and so forth. That's how it works. This is not supposed to be, even in the, at the church level, a bless me or bless us private party where we're only coming here to have a good time and feel good, and, and uh, then we leave, right? <laughs> and then we're like, oh, back out to the gross world and, and compartmentalize everything. We are supposed to be salty salt and bright light into the world. Matthew 5, 13 through 16 says that exact thing. It says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to throw out and trample underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and gives a light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We are supposed to be out and about shining our light. And what does it say? It says, when that light shines before others, they will see your good deeds. Now, is that so that you can put it on TikTok? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's so that they can see it and they can be like, wow, this person is a loving, merciful, gracious person. Someone that exudes the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, they might not know that they're the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but they're going to be drawn to them. They're going to be like, ooh, I want to get some of that. Remember? Break me off a piece of that Kit Kat bar. <laughs> That's supposed to be us. We're supposed to be the people that people want to be around because we got something. We all say we got something. We put it on our T-shirt or on our bumper sticker. But when it counts, are people seeing what we got? Or is our light under a bowl? Are we out there being salty and not in the modern vernacular? <laughs> Salt is supposed to be flavor, right? I mean, a, a guy's world famous for letting salt hit his forearm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> 
This means that we need to work together and offer a, a taste of the restorative and redemptive work of Jesus here and now. What you imagine heaven's going to feel like and be like, people should feel that coming off of you. <laughs> right? Also, God's kingdom is not spiritual versus secular. It's not us versus them. It is for all. Specifically and practically speaking, this is where the rubber meets the road, there are a lot of great people and great organizations in our city doing amazing things to help people in need, and some of them are not faith-based. Can you believe such a thing? So maybe we should stop trying to do it all on our own. If someone's already out there doing a good thing, maybe we should join them, right? Every church, for whatever reason, is trying to do it all on their own. They need this kind of ministry. They need this kind of ministry. They need this kind of ministry. And we're going to try to spread ourselves so thin that we don't do anything good. <laughs> we just do... Uh, uh, we want to be able to say that we do all of these things. And it's like, why reinvent the wheel? If someone's already doing it well, we should just join them and be there for them. There are a lot of things that need to get done here in the church and out there. And it's time that we start to collaborate and make it happen. God has placed us in our unique communities, this community as well as a larger community, with our unique set of skills, and we're not supposed to just be sitting around biding our time. You know, I grew up in a Pentecostal church, and it seemed like all too often, all they did was sang and prayed and preached about, oh, a few more weary days a few more awful days of being here and we're going to see Jesus. Hallelujah. And it's like, is that the attitude we're supposed to have? Are we just holding on? Just trying to make it? No. Is that the blessed hope? Is that going to be a glorious day? Yes. But what do we do today and tomorrow and next week and the day after that and the week after that and month? And We're supposed to be busy about his business. We're supposed to be getting the gospel out there. We're supposed to be loving people to death. <laughs> but we're not. We're either so caught up in ourselves that we don't do much at all, except for go to work and go home and watch Netflix. <laughs> but we're supposed to be collaborating and making something happen. Not every opportunity will, will be a great fit. Not everybody is called to do every little thing, but there are opportunities that you can be involved in that will fit. And you're not going to know until you try, right? Like the little uh, ball that used to be in every church nursery that has the different shaped blocks and you got to try to... Well, how do you know that the star doesn't fit in the square? Because you jam it on there and it doesn't go. Well, we're not going to know what we're called to do or how we can do it or where we can help if we don't try it. So we need to start trying some stuff. <laughs> and if it's not a good fit, well, then you stop jamming it in there and you turn the little thing and you try to find the right one, right? So we're not called to twiddle our thumbs. If we want to live out the Great Commission, if we want to grow in community, and live by his commandments, then we must find ways to collaborate for the common good. It's all four, all four C's up there. <laughs> if we want to live out the Great Commission, grow in community, and live by his commandments, we must find ways to collaborate for the common good. So here's how we're going to close out. I have two questions. Number one, what can you do to collaborate with others and serve our community here at Life? We have needs right now. We need people to serve in this church community. As a matter of fact, as you leave today, there are some clipboards out on the welcome booth, probably in the hands of some greeters, and they're going to give you the opportunity, if you're willing, to sign up, to give me your name, your number, 
and where you want to uh, help out if you have any idea. If you don't know if it's a star or a square, <laughs> we'll figure it out. I'll get a hold of you. Question number two, what can you do to collaborate with others and serve outside these walls, outside of life? Again, same clipboard, same pen, name, number, I'll get a hold of you. If you want to try to find something, you want to see where you fit, I'll help you. And let's get collaborating. So please, on your way out, find a clipboard, sign it, and then we can start collaborating in here, in this community, and out there. Um, there's lots of people in need. How many of you know that? And we're supposed to be helping. We're supposed to be doing our part. So let's not let those widows go hungry. Let's get the, the powerful, spirit-filled people in those roles uh, as soon as possible. You with me? Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much for this amazing day to come together to worship with my brothers and sisters. And I just pray that we will uh, just keep in mind that if we want to accomplish what you've called us to do, if we want to accomplish the Great Commission, if we want to uh, be faithful to the Great Commandment, if we want to have a true community uh, here, we have to start collaborating with one another and outside these walls. And I just pray, Lord God, that you'll give us wisdom, that you'll direct us, that if something doesn't fit, that we won't be discouraged. We'll just move on to the next. And we just love you so much. We put our faith and trust in you. You're an amazing God. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.